Magic stuff. Well, welcome back. If you've been following the first recording in this series, uh, you will now have two desktop class machines um, with uh, huge amounts of RAM and disk, now fully configured as Hyper-V nodes and under the management control of your VMM server. We've got a little bit of work to do before we're finally ready to push out some virtual machines. Um, and the only thing I've done since our last uh, meeting was I've created a new user in our Active Directory called Cloud001. This user will become the actual user account uh, for the tenants that we're going to use to actually push out and validate that uh, everything that we do in this particular part of the exercise works through. Okay, so let's get started. The first thing I'd like to do is just recap our network. So we've created a logical network that we're going to use for our clouds. That was bog standard logical network and within that logical network we said it will not be connected so each VLAN will be set with the VLAN ID of zero because we're not using VLANs and instead we're just using IPs to segregate. So if one, two and three all set on the same VLAN as we said our home hardware has no VLAN support and I've created an IP pool for each of those specific VLANs. In addition, we switched over to the VM and services view and on the virtual networks we went ahead and actually created a virtual network for the Cloud VLAN 1 and Cloud VLAN 2 and as a result of that VMM automatically figured out that I did earlier create at the logical network level an IP pool and presented that pool back up as far as me here to let me see that there are currently 253 addresses available. Remember address 1 we utilize for the gateway, the gateway which doesn't actually exist in our home network. Okay so we have pretty much our network bits and pieces sorted out. The next thing that we want to switch over to is back onto the fabric view and this time we will configure somewhere to actually store our virtual hard disks. Now we could build a cluster um, but we're at home we don't really have shared storage and iSCSI is a little bit beyond our grasp um, and besides the point Microsoft are singing and dancing that everything moving forward is going to be SMB3. So given the fact that our VMM server is already a Windows Server 2012 box, which means it is SMB3 ready to go, then we're going to take advantage of that and use it as the store point for our virtual hard disks that both of our hosts are going to use. We've got a little bit of work to do, so let's go ahead and the very first thing we need to do is we need to add a storage device and of course this is where we have the ability to add the uh, SMIS managed iSCSI uh, or NAS targets. Um, in my case we're sticking with the very first one which is a Windows based server. The server in question again was going to be PDC VM, sorry it's PDC SC for the System Center Virtual Machine Manager and I have to have some permission to talk to it so we'll use the user role we created earlier on local administrative um, again not something you're going to do in production and then with a reach out we can quickly find out that uh, the machine has uh, 45 gig of space available for storing our hard disks we're going to have to deal with that that's a little bit tight um, and he's also telling us that there is already a share on this that's not being managed um, and that share uh, isn't being managed for storage services for our virtual machines instead that's been used by VMM for its library so we're going to leave that alone um, that's offered by default when we install VMM on the machine okay so everything is pretty good and he confirms that we're managed this thing to WMI that now puts in place our storage and if I take a look I can now see that I've got a new provider in and that provider is basically saying that we have a communication back to our host and if I look at the actual file servers I can see that our host is in it's been registered with the capacity available and it's also showing us that we have the VMM library share but isn't being managed or made available for us for storage which is cool so we now need to go ahead and organize something that's going to be used as a share for everything else. Okay, so what Virtual Machine Manager didn't capture is that I actually happen to have another disk in this machine. So I'm going to create a file share. I'm going to call this one my um, SMB3 uh, share. And I'm going to build it obviously on 
the file server we've just added, uh, my VMM server. And as I mentioned, I have a share of uh, a drive called D drive, and we'll make a share in there called SMB3. Click Add, and if all goes to plan, VMM should go find that disk and share it out. So, so far so good, it looks like it's in and it's managed. And since we're on the same host, let's click on a D drive, and there we go, our new SMB3 folder has been created. And if we go a step further, we can see that it is actually being shared out as well, automatically. So thank you very much, VMM, for taking care of that work for me. Okay, now, let's look at the classifications. Um, we know classifications are one of those things that are really cool for telling users the untruths. So in this case, we're just going to make a label gold storage. Because all of our storage is really gold, it's brilliant stuff. Um, now, that's done, label done, we'll come back and look at that a little bit later on. The only thing we've left to do now is go back as far as our hosts. Now if we were clustered we'd only have to do this once, but we're not, so we're going to have to do this on each host separately. So on the host, we'll go down as far as the properties, and we'll switch over to the storage tab. On a storage tab, we're going to tell the system that it needs to use file share storage, and we now can pick that SMB3 share. When I add that in, he tells me there's 99.9 .9 gig available, so I assign that, and then I can go to the second node, let's go down to which properties, again on storage, add the file share, so now both nodes will use the same file share for storing their virtual hard disks on, and that's their preferred locations, or that will be their preferred locations. Okay, great. Now, we're getting very, very close, so we've set up the actual location where we're going to store our virtual hard disks. We've created um, both of our hosts to actually point at that storage location. So I think the next thing we're going to do is we'll switch back to our VM review and we will start and we'll create our very first cloud. So I'm right clicking and I'm going to select that I want to make cloud 001 and on this cloud I am going to say it's going to span across all my hosts and I am going to offer the ability to use the logical networks that belong to cloud. Now I'm not offering Fabric because that's a no-no, a Fabric we're keeping for the administrators for managing the stuff, as I said, clustering, live migration, system management. The clouds, that's what's going to effectively be the separate networks that each of our cloud tenants can use. We haven't done any of the advanced stuff for playing with load balancers, so we can skip through that. Similarly, VIP templates are used for the IP addresses used by the load balancers, so not important. And then effectively, what are the classifications we're going to offer back to our user? So again, essentially, this is where we light the user, and I believe we configured one for high bandwidth initially, so we'll offer that one out to the user. And behind the scenes, if you remember, that one was actually set up uh, as being a, a low bandwidth um, actual port profile rather than classification. Now we need to give access to the library. Um, we have a defined library, so we'll give access to that library to the user. Um, that's important because in the library we're going to have to put an ISO file um, so we can deploy an operating system. Um, we haven't done that yet, we'll do that in a few moments. Um, also just back on this page, the ability to store VMs. So if we want to offer the user to actually move the VMs off the virtual Hyper-V servers and move them back as far as the actual library's place, we can define where that is. Um, it's not really important, but certainly something you should play with. Um, and of course we want to actually set a capacity for our clouds. Um, running on the hardware we are, uh, capacity is pretty much uh, something that is a luxury. So I'm going to reduce this down to only 2 gig available on this cloud of memory and I'm going to go as far as 35 gig of storage is available for the VHDs. Um, might give me just about one virtual machine in this particular case, but that's fine, that's enough. And of course the virtual machine type is going to be Hyper-V. And that's all that we need to do to create our cloud. So the first cloud should be in place and we can see it on the screen. Now cloud is not much good if we don't have a tenant, so we'll go ahead and we'll create a user role, um, or tenancy as it is uh, called, and I'll call this one Again, cloud 001 tenant. And this uh, tenant is only going to be able to do self service stuff. And if you remember at the very start of the recording, I suggested that I actually went away and created an account in Active Directory called cloud 
001 for my test user. Now, best practice would suggest that you shouldn't use a user account, but you should use a group account in here. Um, so that way then you can manage who's access to these tenancies to the Active Directory groups. It makes things a lot easier. Um, but again, I'm at home and I'm testing this on a lab, so I'm bending the rules just a little bit to demonstrate what's happening here. I now need to scope it, so this tenant's going to have access to the only cloud available. Um, if there were additional clouds I want that tenant to see, this is where I will make that change, and I can come back in and modify this at any point in time. I also get the ability to scope down what the tenant can do. So already we've limited the cloud to 2 gig of RAM and 35 gig. I can then turn around and say that this tenancy can have even less than that. So out of the cloud he's only allowed to have maybe 1 gig. Um, or any particular user of this tenancy can be only restricted down so that they don't hog the whole uh, cloud um, on everybody else in the team. Um, with that in place, I'm not going to make any changes there because we're kind of running tight. Uh, the only thing that I need to define next is the VM network. Uh, and we looked at those already. So this is the first network I built as a VM network that I wanted to make available in my cloud. So cloud one is getting the VM network one. There could be scenarios when you want more than one VM network. Um, for example, if your cloud was supposed to simulate a production and a demilitarized zone, if you were testing maybe Exchange, then you can add additional ones in here. But for majority of your clouds, a uh, single network is probably going to be the common uh, configuration. Additionally, if the user of the cloud or the tenants of the cloud wants to supply their own VHDs or ISOs and stuff, then we can effectively get a share, uh, an SMB share, and define that here. And that will then show up as part of their actual cloud roles so they can see any VHDs and ISOs um, every time the library refreshes. By default, that happens once an hour. Uh, so it is important that if the user does put something up there, unless he manually refreshes the library and assuming his permission to do that, uh, then it won't show up for approximately one hour. Um, and then in addition, if I've got special resources in a managed library that I want to give the user, uh, maybe it's a special build of Windows or something like that, then I can obviously add those in here as well. And finally, the actions. What is it the user can do? Um, and from this list, we would pick and select the choices that makes most sense. So we didn't give the ability to store VMs, so there's no point giving him the ability to actually pick that choice in the menus. Um, but he will want to be able to stop, start, shut down, even save, and uh, probably remotely connect to that virtual machine. And of course, delete it when he's finished. Um, sharing and receiving shared virtual machines is something that's quite interesting if you've got tenants that want to share stuff between each other in different clouds or same clouds then you can turn that feature on um, and of course the owner of the VM being the tenant he'll want to have local administrator privileges we didn't create any templates as yet we're going to be working from VHDs and ISO files so we'll just allow them to deploy from uh, whatever happens to be in the library, the VHDs. But if you did define that you wanted to make specific templates, then you could restrict the user to only have that access. And finally, do we give the user the ability to make checkpoints? Snapshots in Hyper-V terms, although I believe in R2 that's actually now finally changing to the word checkpoint as well. Um, so that he can actually roll back and move forward depending on what he's doing in his virtual machine. And the last of the offerings up here is authoring, um, which is one of the service template features in VMM. We can look at that again while you start playing with the environment, but uh, for in the purposes of this test, we don't need to grant that permission. If, in addition, you want to give the user um, access to any of the user roles, so for example, you wanted his virtual machine to be able to join the domain with that local administrative pass, but you didn't want to share the password, you could give him access to this uh, VMM access role. He won't see the passwords in the background. Of course, our cloud networks are isolated, they're not connected anywhere, so even if he does push a virtual machine out, he's never going to ping my nodes, so therefore there isn't a lot of value in offering him that particular account. But different scenarios for different requirements. Okay, that should then get us to the point of creating our first tenancy. So at this point we have our cloud and our tenants. I think we are just about ready to start thinking about actually building out our virtual machines. So let's not just go ahead and build the virtual machine just yet, but what we're going to do instead is we're going to open a new connection to Virtual Machine Manager and I'm going to specify new credentials. So I'm going to go in as DigiNerve Lab as the user for Cloud 001 because I want to see what we've just given him access to. 
is password. And after a few moments, we'll have a second VMM console open up. SCVMM now will open up a new console, but this time the view will be dropped from administrative down as far as the view for our brand new tenant. Okay, and there we go, Cloud001 tenant is on screen, and I can see pretty much actually things aren't the same. I've lost the access to the fabric, that button no longer exists, and when I look at the library, I can see a cloud library and oh yeah there's my VHDs and stuff so that looks pretty good um, and if I look at my VMs and settings and clouds I actually see the clouds that we created but I only see actually one VM network so as you can see the roles have essentially restricted back what it is we cannot uh, can and cannot see in uh, this particular view of the console now we've got one or two last pieces to do, um, so let's uh, close out of that console for a moment, we'll pop that back there in a second. Um, I need to go back to the library, and in the library I want to actually set up an ISO file that we can use for deploying Windows. So let me right click on it, and go to Explore, that opens up Windows Explorer, and then with the magic of a record, I'm able to paste back in an ISO. And the ISO I'm putting into a subfolder here, um, quite simply called ISOs, and this is a Windows 2012 image. Okay, that's uh, going to be used for our uh, test machines that we're going to deploy as a cloud user. Right, back in the console, we need to actually refresh. I didn't mention it takes one hour for that to happen. That's far too long for me to be waiting here and recording. So I'll right click until it's do a refresh. I shall see the job kick off. And then within a few moments, the job should complete and my ISO should now be in the library and ready for me to utilize. Good stuff, okay.